all sorts of nappy and turny bits. The button up here that's broken and this one's just really broken and I have no idea what to do about that. Uh, it doesn't matter. So, um, today's adventure we're going to talk about um, a rather interesting uh, series of events and I might get a little bit emotional on this. Uh, I'm going to try not to do that. Um, but we're going to call this the tale of my experiences with Thieves World, specifically the three five rules for Thieves World. And when I got my hands on these, I I just fell in love with it. I I I, I, I liked everything about it. I liked the way that their approach to magic. I liked how they had the potential to like die in combat immediately and get or your wounds get infected or you could just be slinging curses left and right or the classes. I just Everything about it, I just immediately fell in love with this system. And I'm like, you know, this series sounds really awesome. This game sounds really awesome. So I went out of my way. I, I, I got the, the, the player's handbook for the, for the game. And I, I get to reading this thing. I'm like, I like this game. I like what I'm seeing. I want to run this. I definitely want to run this. So I start uh, making this campaign. And I'm working on this campaign. And I probably worked on it for a good six to eight months before I ran it. Now, a little bit of backstory. Um, at the time in my group, um, my group was kind of, um, I hate to say complaining, but um, to quote Aliens Guy, I'm not saying it was Aliens, but it was Aliens. They were complaining. They're like, oh, we, we, we want, we, we, oh, we don't want to be constricted to the plot railroad. Not that they ever were considering their general consensus of, oh, look, plot, we're going to go over here now. That's oh, look. mostly me. Come on, get get that. Yeah, some yeah, the others started doing it too. Don't don't give me that. <laughs> I remember I was watching the Conan movie, and and there was a scene where they, 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 they climb the tower and they steal this jewel. So I got this great idea that I was going to have a campaign that was going to kind of center around this, like, fist-sized jewel. It's like a yellowish jewel called the Jewel of Arendius. Yeah. I'm clever with names. So this campaign that I gave them, you know, I uh, kind of looked at it. I was like, all right, all right, fine. Free, because you guys seem to think I'm star foxing you, keep all that footage in there. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> it's it's going to be amazing when that light just shows up randomly. Mm. So, you know, the way they said it, you'd think I was giving them, you know, like the first Star Fox game. Just this on-rails shooter type situation, guiding them from place to place with little or no input, you know, from them on it. I wasn't. It's more like uh, Metal Gear Solid 3, where there was a bunch of areas you could run around in, but they're still kind of funneled. They, they, they want more open freedom? Fine. I'm going to give them Morrowind. It's just, here's a world, go. Oh, well, yeah. Oh, you want a quest? Oh, better start talking to people, asshole. So I start, you know, writing this quest, and I'm writing this quest, and I'm writing this quest, and I kind of look, and I'm like, you know, knowing my group, there's going to be, because it's, even though it's using the, the 3-0 rules, there's so many newer things that they're adding to it and so many things that they're changing that I, I, I better get a second player's handbook. So I get a second player's handbook. I'm like, you know what, knowing my group, more than one person is going to need it, so I get a third player's handbook. Because, you know, I was really excited about this. I read this book back and forwards, forward and backwards. Heck, even when, on a, even when I went on a vacation, in, in, instead of relaxing and having a fun time, I was nose deep in this book. So, what I'm trying to convey is, I was excited to do this. And I, like, learned the city in and out, you know, learned this district and that district, and I filled it with NPCs left and right. And... Well, you can imagine with all that preparation, how terrible it turned out. So anyway, yeah, I leave them in a part of the town called the Maze, which is a part of the town that is, it's just a maze of streets, and it doesn't help the fact that the buildings are so poorly constructed that they fall over and new buildings are built there to be get on top of them. 
very few standing structures remain in the same place. So they go off and they brutally murder a guard because that's what you do, I guess. And they kind of begin the campaign. And it starts off pretty good. They go out, they talk to some people, and they get a job. And, you know, they, they, they get some money under the belt. And then, you know, they, they reach a point where they can start living comfortably. And, you know, I'm not, like, like I said, it's Morrowind. You don't talk to people. Not going to get quests. They have a little bit of problem with this. Uh, after a while, one of them look at me, looks at me in the eyes and says, I'm not having any fun. We're not doing anything. And uh, I, I got a little angry. So I'm like, all right. Well, you're not... I could have just out and said, well, yeah, you're not doing anything because you're not doing anything. Not to be daunted, I, 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 kept, I kept that campaign, I kept my notes, and I kept working on them. Got about another four to six months in on it when I finally got a group online that was really excited to play it. And, um, you know, it was entirely the same with them. They also brutally murdered the guard. They... You know, talk to this, talk to a lot of the same people. They, they actually got further. They actually got through the first story arc of the campaign. Uh, nothing too crazy happened there, except for one of them was a statistical anomaly. Um, because at the time, I had also just discovered the Book of Erotic Fantasy, um, which is basically the three five three zero Book of Sex, which was kind of a prominent thing in Thieves' World because I mean. Literally, one of the prestige classes is you become a pimp. Like, you become a pimp and you have whores that bring money in, and you can, like, eventually at higher levels, you get the ability to, like, blackmail political figures because they sleep with your whores, and you know this. Yeah, so, so, it was like a, a match made in heaven. And his statistical anomaly was, as a joke, the, the first time you slept with a woman, I roll on the pregnancy table, pregnant. Twins. All right. It was kind of a joke. We all, all had a good laugh. You know, he, he bangs some more prostitutes. He jokes about it, so I roll out for those prostitutes. Pregnant twins. Pregnant twins. And now we're, and now we're having real good jokes with it, because, you know, you know, hey, you know, three times in a row. The rest of that campaign, every time you say he slept with a woman. Pregnant twins. Including in, in, including two of the other players, which I was totally like, uh, I don't want to roll this. It's it's your character. I don't want to dictate your character. If you don't, <laughs> and they're like, no, you well, you, you got to roll. It's like, are you sure? Because I, I don't, you know, I didn't want to do it, but they're like, no, you got to roll. So I rolled it, and pregnant twins. <laughs> so knowing that the first group is not going to play the game, or. Maybe I was just feeling jaded at the time against them and playing this game. Um, I, uh, I, I, I got some other players, went out. Uh, about half, uh, a couple of the players from the old group were still in on this one. They talked to this guy, they get this mission, as everyone else did, that they had to go to this dock and they had to, to, to basically rob this boat. What I didn't tell them was, this guy was the, the, the captain slash owner of this boat. And the whole setup was is they were supposed to figure it out on their own if they went down there and case the joint, which they did. Like, it was unusual because the boat's been in the harbor for a couple of days, but it hasn't unloaded anything. And, and the whole idea was is, is as I said before, he owned the boat. They, they were supposed to, to rob the boat, basically, while it was in harbor. To basically, so they could basically smuggle goods into the town, you know, before it gets through customs, you know, it's robbed. So, you know, A, they get an insurance claim on it because, A, you know, our shipment was robbed, and B, you know, nobody's going to know that it was, you know, drugs. Which it was a very potent drug that I had literally made up for the whole campaign, and... Uh, one of the things that I was kind of, going to kind of do is I wanted to kind of um, hammer home the, the the very twisted, messed up nature and just how dark this world was. So when they were out on the boat, um, I made them, like, notice that 
also in the cargo hold was a a a, a large collection of, uh, of 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 slaves, particularly child slaves. Their solution was one that um, I didn't see coming. Uh, they decided, whereas the other groups um, planned their escapes with, let's just let these children go, and as they're running away, we go away in the, uh, under the cover of darkness. No, these guys were, um, let's set the boat on fire and run away with the kids. Yeah, um, not only did they manage to set the boat on fire, they also managed to set the dock on fire. To my knowledge, these docks were very important to the city because it was the one thing that this in this city that the citizens were able to say was theirs that they built with their own bare hands, their own blood, sweat, and tears. It'd be kind of like um, if you burned down the Great Wall of China like 20 years after it was completed. And then I, you know, send some black clad guys to talk to them again. And for some reason, they don't want to talk to the black clad guys. So that, so that they light them on fire. It was at this point that they also discovered because um, one of them got a prostitute, bought her, took her back to their room at the Vulgar Unicorn, and then said they fell asleep. So, needless to say, the prostitute robbed them. And the next morning, after they light these two mysterious guys on fire, um, they see one of the prostitutes of the Vulgar Unicorn, grab her and basically start interrogating her because I guess in their minds all prostitutes live together. Uh, she tries to get away and starts going down the stairs because the, it, they're set on, set on the second floor of the Vulgar Unicorn, which is a famous inn in the series. If you're familiar with the series, you've probably heard of the Vulgar Unicorn. When the, the, uh, one, the big burly guy of the group says he jumps down the stairs and tackles her. Thin, spindly prostitute, big, uh, burly fighter man, flying down the stairs. He just surfed her down the stairs. Like that scene in, you know, uh, was it Two Towers where Legolas surfs the shield? Yeah, replace the shield with the prostitute. That major part of the campaign's gone because they were going to be doing a lot of stuff out of the Vulgar Unicorn because, you know, it's like the Moss Eisley Cantina. You play Star Wars. You go to Tatooine, you go to the Moss Eisley Cantina. If for nothing else than, than to see B. Arthur have a cool song and dance. So, yeah, they, they get kicked out. And they start wandering around the maze. When I have them come across uh, two shops. One of them was this, like, apothecary, potion-y type shop. Which was supposed to be... It was supposed to be one of the contacts that they were supposed to get because he was going to be this ooh cryptic Obi-Wan type guy that gives them little hints on their missions and, and basically identifies their equipment for them when they get magic weapons. He tried to make a bargain with them about getting the crate that they got off the ship and giving it to him in exchange for his services. Uh, they apparently didn't like that and wanted money so they burnt his shop down. Take that, Deckard Kane. Yeah, yeah, they, they burnt down Deckard Kane's shop. So you can see how this campaign's going. So, eventually, um, uh, Smuggler Guy contacts him again. And he says that he needs the jewel that I mentioned earlier, the jewel of Arendius. Ooh, ooh. And it's in, you know, it's in possession of a local gem merchant. Guy is crazy about gems. He gets gems from all over, and he just got the jewel of Arendius. And it's, he says, he it's it's needed by his benefactors, which you know that's never a good sign. But whatever, they've already committed to being on the evil side of this campaign. I say evil in the sense that this is thieves' world, and there is no good side. And as of before, I got a, a year and a half of planning, so I got this guy's like his house planned out, 
like a small guard house next to his house planned out, the sewers leading up to his house, like the whole block planned out. And um, so yeah, they, they go there. Don't case the place, because why would you ever need to case the place? Go right up to the front door, try to break in. Naturally, the guards scare him off. Eventually, they get the idea to go through the sewers. So they go up through the sewers, break into this guy's house. They're sneaking around. They alert the guards almost immediately, and the guards attack and kill one of the players. No problem. Because of the setup, there was leeway for just randomly a member of their caravan, which they started off, they were in a caravan. Caravan got robbed. And the members of the caravan, you know, scattered, scattered sticks to survive. Or sticks in the wind, or leaves in the wind, or whatever the analogy is. As the guards are chasing them out of this house, they disguise themselves as servants to a uh, very prominent family. Now, as I might have said before, I'm going to say it again, I'm terrible with names. Like, really, really bad with names. I, I named the jewel the Jewel of Arendius. Yeah, because that sounds mystical in my head. Heck, I, I named a Russian man Clark Esky. All right. They want to know this Russian's name, and I say, his name's Clark. And they're like, that's not Russian. Clark Esky. Boris Clark Esky. <laughs> Real Russian man. That's what his business card says. <laughs> they disguise themselves as the servants of the Capuletti family. Yes. I like Romeo and Juliet. Yes. They were rivals with the Montegui family. Yes. I also like the Reefer Madness musical. And if you don't get either of those references, I'm really sad. You, pr you should probably read Romeo and Juliet and watch the Reefer Madness musical. It's, it's quite good. Right? Right. See, he agrees with me. And they actually spend a couple of days disguised as these servants, running around, doing servants things. The entire time, they're casing, they start casing the Montegui household. I don't know why they're casing the Montegui household. I think they just want to rob it because they just heard about it and they know that these guys are rich. Because I'm thinking, I'm like, fine, great, good, great. They're doing their own thing, you know? It's it's something that's possible to do because I, I had almost this entire city mapped out in my head and on paper. Usually the parts that were on paper turned out to be better than the parts I just had mapped out in my head. They get these, like, firebombs set up. They have, like, on the day in question, they go out, they uh, rob a cart and fill it with robbed hay. Burning down the hay merchant. They somehow get this cart of hay, like, on the grounds and in a good position. That's like, so it's like right next to the house. And then on the day in question, they like throw these firebombs and it hits the hay. The hay, of course, explodes in flames. And the house, you know, catches fire. Guards are running around screaming, trying to put the fire out. This house is in flames. They, you know, run into the house, you know, looking like they're trying to help stuff out. They kick down the front door. They get in the front door. They look around, you know, and I'm like, all right, you know, start pulling my sheets out. I pull the plan of the house out so I got that. And I, more, more importantly, I pull out the loot sheet of what's in the house, you know. Silverware, jewelry, that kind of thing. They said, all right. We run upstairs, find the secret vault, pry it open, and grab the jewel. And I'm like, um, what? You know, the the jewel of Arendius. You know, we like, last time we were here, we 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 saw where the vault was, so we, so we know where it is. We we just immediately run to it. Um. This isn't this isn't the this, this this isn't the house, and they're like, "What? No, this this is the Montegui house. You guys specifically said you you do this to the Montegui house. Yeah, the gem merchant. I never said the gem merchant was a Montegui. And they're like, "Well, then why did you let us do this? Like, I thought you wanted to rob the Montegui's. <laughs> so they just leave. You know, like an entire session worth of planning, probably about eight in eight 
nine in-game days worth of planning, just, eh, let's just leave. I'm like, oh, okay. Put my stuff away. They immediately go back. You know, they're like, oh, okay, well, we find this house. Okay, so they find the gem merchant's house. Sure enough, it's a different house. Just like I told them. So they once again go, go through the sewers. Um, and they seem kind of surprised when I start, you know, making them roll against all these traps that are in the sewers. They're like, well, those traps weren't there before. Yeah, but recently, you know, five assholes came flying out of the bathroom door and, you know, started murdering guards left and right. They once again get to the bathroom. They break down the door to the bathroom again and go running out into the main room, screaming and hollering and... The eyes roll over white and all the screaming and the hollering and the pounding. I, I flashed back to Jaws there for a second. Uh, anyway, so... <clears throat> You know, they're, they're going through here, they're fighting the guards, fighting the guards, and once again, surprised that there's more guards than there were last time. It's almost like five, five assholes, you know, rampaged through this house, you know, earlier this week. They're fighting through, they're fighting through, they're fighting through. One of the players almost dies. Another player dies outright. So, once again... They run away, tail between their legs. They once again go through the sewers. Once again, shocked that there are more traps in the sewers this time. One of, them, one of them almost dies halfway through when they decide that they're not going to go after the jewel anymore. I'm like, well, you know, it's, you, you, but, but you know, that's the mission that you were assigned. And they fire back that, well, actually, you know, since, you know, two of us are, 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 are new to this party, you know, we wouldn't go after the jewel because it's not, our characters would have no investment in this jewel and they wouldn't care about it, so they wouldn't go after it. Well, I do agree that, you know, it is your character. There is still, you know, party cohesion and, and you know, like, yeah, granted, yeah, your character wouldn't do this, but at the same time, theoretically, by that logic, you know, a paladin, by that logic, would never partner with a rogue because a rogue does, you know, dishonorable things and he would not stay in his honor to do things, but you still do it because, you know, it's the party and you want to have fun. You know, there's no fun. You know, theoretically, a paladin should only be in a group with other paladins, ideally. Paladins, clerics are maybe fighters, possibly monks, as long as they all worship the same god, so, yeah. AKA, they don't want to get the jewel because they're they're fed up that, you know, stuff is getting harder because, you know, five assholes keep flying out of this bathroom and killing the guards. So yeah, they, they, they pretty much, you know, decide they don't want to do the campaign anymore. And they're blaming me. It's basically, they're, they're kind of doing it in this way that they're kind of accusing me of saying it's my fault. Apparently they were still bitter about this whole Montague thing. That's my story on, 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 on my attempt to get my friends to play Thieves' Role. Y you probably noticed I'm kind of a little bitter. I I'll admit I'm bitter because, yeah, I'm bitter. To be fair, it was a year and a half worth of planning that they, you know, two groups decided they didn't want to play because of stuff that they did or they weren't doing. Ironically, the very next campaign that I did um, was actually completely on rails. It was actually more Final Fantasy XIII than, you know, anything else. And I'll tell you about that one. Until then, uh, I'm the DM and... I am a man! That went a lot. That went a lot better. I think they go a lot better. Yeah, yeah. I got a lot more details. Uh, is this is is this where we come to this to the shocking conclusion while the credits are rolling that this is the second time we filmed this? No. Ooh. Is that why you have a hat in some of these and why you don't in others? I might have a hat. We still have to look at the footage. <laughs> um. Yeah. Ah, crap. 
crap. I forgot the championship belt. Rewind. Uh, nah, just... Yeah, we'll just throw it in here after the... Music's probably over right now, right? Oh well, yeah, but I just rolled the credits back up over the screen, so oh. here we are back in the moment. Mm. Oh yeah, um... One of the writing gags that I put throughout all of my campaigns. I have this character that always shows up in all my campaigns, and he is called, uh... The Bum. And he's always dressed the same. He's period appropriate, but it's always the same. He's got dirty brown pants that were black pants at one point. Um, like two or three sashes tied around his waist, tied around his waist to keep his pants up, of varying colors. Uh, some kind of vest or like torn sleeve shirt or something, as well as two sleeves on each arm with various tears and all of them different colors. Sometimes they usually match with the belts, you know. They, they go with his deep blue eyes. A yellow blonde beard and black hair. And de depending on the period, he, he, he usually has, you know, the, that, that stocking hat, you know, that it's just, I forget what it's called. The running gag with this guy is um, because he, he always has this belt with him. And he, it, 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 it's a big gold belt. Specifically, it's the WCW uh, World Heavyweight Champion Big Gold Belt. The joke being that um, when I originally introduced him, he didn't have any defining feature, and then we made him in a wrestling game where he, he, he always had the WCW belt because I figured, you know, Vince McMahon just probably threw that, chucked that in the trash after, you know, he unified it with the WWF Championship belt and he didn't need it anymore because... David Arquette won the goddamn thing, so the thing was fucking useless anyway. He might as well throw it in the trash. So the idea was, is the bum would find this big gold belt, and him being, you know, what he was, rather than, you know, be like, oh, I have a belt now, I can sell this for booze, or I can keep this belt, it's, did you lose this belt? Because the bum is, is well, the bum is secretly me. Like, like it, it, is, it is me personified... In the games, so he so he knows everything that I know, in the game. So he, he he's aware that it's a game, and I still have at least some reverence for WCW because, I mean, granted, yes, I was a WWF fan, but you know, I still liked when WCW was there. Plus, my first wrestling live show was a WCW event. So, there you go. You know, I I, I still have some reverence for WCW. So he's always on the lookout, trying to find the owner of this belt. But in the thieves' world. Um, I declared it as, it was a cursed item, called the Belt of the Champion. What that meant was, um, the only way this belt could be taken off you is someone had to beat you for the belt. Generally that meant to kill you for the belt because it was, it was like a gladiatorial thing. You know, like, like, they like, yes, that's my belt, took the belt, put it on. Asshole's now wearing a big gold belt in a game called Thieves World. And the belts, and, and, and the belt, but as it was cursed, made him always want to fight in combat. He eventually did lose that belt, um, specifically to his brother. His brother was a survivor. Um, now, those of you that know the Thieves World D20 system are like, oh, oh, oh. Those of you that don't know it and are just familiar with the 3-5 system is the survivor is the thieves world equivalent of a monk. So there they are in the arena. Wearing much still wearing the stuff that they had, you know, at the beginning of the game. AKA he's maybe got leather armor on and this hidden blade. Whereas the monk is sitting over there and he's a monk. The monk won. The monk beat his ass. And the monk didn't want to kill his brother, but the crowd wanted blood. Now, I was totally, like, I was totally open with this. I was totally going to have a Maximus the Merciful type situation if he didn't kill his brother. He didn't spare him. He became the new champion. That belt changed hand, I think, one or two more times after that. But that was about it. Anyway. Um... Quickly roll the credits. You know, 
You started off saying we're totally ripping it off Counter Monkey, and then we eventually became Wrestle Wrestle. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> then let's rip off Wrestle Wrestle. <laughs> WrestleMania's coming. I'll be ripped that off.